other of the post-coronavirus sociological theory lectures. Uh, this one is on uh, Max Weber's Social Psychology of the World Religions. Um, it's one. It's the first ex essay on religion in uh, the edited volume from Max Weber, uh, Essays in Sociology by Gerthen Mills. Um, my copy is from uh, 1946. Um, so just to sort of show you where that is. Um, I'm realizing Weber died at like 56. We're almost of an age. Um, anyway, um, so social psychology of the world religions. Um, so what we'll, we'll do, we'll sort of walk our way through his main argument in this um, uh, chapter, and then we'll be making comparisons and contrasts to other um, of his, uh, sort of other of his writings on the social psychology of world religions in his broader uh, study. Uh, I have in front of me uh, his book, The Religions of China, my copy of which is beginning to really fall apart. Uh, his book, um, Ancient Judaism, which is one of the best reads um, I've had, I think, apart from uh, Robertson Smith on The Religion of the Semites, Ancient, Ancient Judaism by Weber is just fantastic for sort of outlining the social structure and of, of, um, of both Egypt and, um, you know, and the... Uh, um, Israeli, uh, you know, culture and the way that um, Judaism evolved within a very specific social setting. So some of that is going to be here. I also have uh, near me my copies of Economy and Society. It's that big two-volume set that includes quite a bit of this writing. And um, most of what Weber was doing in this essay is doubled in uh, in economy and society. So at any rate, let's just sort of walk through a little bit of what's in this last uh, section of Girth and Mills. So the first half of the book is really his discussion of sort of politics and society. And the last half of the book is, um, is again, a kind of collection of Aver's writings on the economic theology and history of capitalism. Again, the essay we'll be looking at is the social psychology of the world religions. Uh, I was just teaching this the other night to my uh, graduate students. Um, on page 302 is the Protestant Sex and the Spirit of Capitalism, which includes some of Weber's most accessible writings on, um, on sort of religion and capitalism, it, it, some of which is based upon his personal travels uh, in, um, in the United States in about like 1903, 1904, somewhere in there. Um, so... Um, and then there's the religious rejections of the world and their directions. I'm thinking of recording a separate uh, a lecture on that. We'll see. And then, again, I'll make brief comparisons to his writings on India, the Brahmin, and the caste, and Chinese literati. Uh, again, these big comparisons to these different historical structures. So some of which will come up uh, just as we get into uh, the book here. Okay, so Weber. So the social psychology of the word religions is, um, um, Weber sort of outlines his project right at the beginning. He argues that there were really only five world religions, but he also includes Judaism because of its uh, status both as a, he thinks a, a specific, um, it played a specific causal role in the development of Western capitalism and it also was, of course, the predecessor to both uh, Jew, um, Christianity and Islam. So there's really five world religions with Judaism thrown in. So, so what is a world religion? He calls it a religiously determined system of life regulation. And in this essay, as in most of his work, the focus is upon what he called economic ethics, right? Which are practical uh, impulses for action uh, that are founded in the psycho psychological and pragmatic context of religion. So, um, you know, when I teach about this, when I write about it, I tend to uh, differentiate um, uh, different aspects of economic ethics. There's an economic ethic related to work. You know, why should one work? How should one work? There's an economic ethic related to leisure time, to the time when one is not working? Should it be productively used? Is it is it time out of ethics and so on? Um, there's an economic, a set of economic ethics related to profit and and the um, and the rightful ownership of profit. Um, there is an economic ethic ethic related to investment, uh, related to uh, 
you know, firm governance or organizational governments. Um, uh, there's one related to sort of the ethics of domination within the workplace. So there, there are different ones, ethics of, of consumption, um, ethics of savings, ethics of inheritance, right? And then there's all of these economic, there's sort, sort of these ethical connections between um, the economy and the political realm, the economy and the family realm, and then finally the economy and sort of the realm of, of, uh, of culture and private life, right? So at any rate, so Weber touches upon all of those things. But again, in this essay, he's primarily interested in economic ethics. So, so again, more about that we'll unpack as we go. So the main thing that Weber argues in the first pages of the essay is that the economic ethic of a world religion depends upon the social strata that that determines its um, its practical ethics. So he basically argues that that each of these world religions um, is is stamped with the um, with, with what he calls the characteristic features of an economic strata that bears the religion or carries at least the economic arguments uh, or or beliefs of the religion. So, so really what we're looking at here is what he would call a carrier strata. So this is, again, a, a strata of society, a strata of society that carries the economic ethic. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a bearer strata, right? So it's, again, a, a, a layer of society that bears the, um, um, the really the ethical quality of the world religion and again stamps it with its character okay so stratify so the strata refers to stratification it's a term that Weber uses in this essay stratification is a term taken into the social sciences really from geology so anyone who's seen a cut alongside of a rural road will see that there's these different strata of material like rock layers or dirt layers or gravel layers and so on uh, so it really refers to a kind of layering so a strata refers to a layer um, and um, so so stratification literally refers to the layering the hierarchical layering of a society into distinct groups um, most of the time when we write and talk about stratification in the social sciences, we emphasize that that there there may be some capacity to move um, up and down in the strata, uh, in the uh, you know in the hierarchy of strata, but usually. Um, there are barriers, right? That that it is difficult to move up and down, which is why we call them straight. That they they make a kind of bounded uh, social reality. So um, Weber really, in the end, in this essay, distinguishes between elite strata, you know, those at the top of society who are in possession of power and and wealth, control of the society, right? And then the lowest strata, generally of pe peasants, or sometimes we refer to them as plebeians and so on, uh, and then middle strata. So we have high, low, and middle, high, low, and middle. You know, in, to a degree, you could think of this in terms of at least the aristocratic the, the sort of traditional European class structure where you have the aristocratic elites at the top, uh, maybe even economic elites, the bourgeois elites and capitalism at the top, various middle strata, and then, you know, peasants and, you know, uh, working people at the bottom. Now, there's a problem with thinking that way in that, you know, in, in, um, in the status hierarchy of Europe that Weber is writing about, um, even the wealthiest capitalist is probably going to be separated in a lower strata than, uh, than the aristocrats and those who are honorific in some way, right? So that gets muddy when we think in those terms. But, but in general, Weber is going to be making the argument that each of the economic ethics of the world religion isn't going to be uh, an elite ethic, nor is it going to be a middle class, or excuse me, an ethic of the poor. It generally is going to be carried by a middle strata. And so part of what he's doing here is trying to sort of specify the historical quality of the middle strata that carries the economic ethic to tell us precisely what it was about it that uh, that stamped its character upon the religion. 
So that seems like a lot of words. What he basically argues is that there's one group in society that's positioned somewhere within the hierarchy of, uh, of stratification that tends to be the bearer or carrier of the religion. And, and that, that group tends to stamp its features upon the faith, and then other groups within the society, other strata, wind up taking on a kind of coloration from the uh, economic ethic that was associated with the bearer strata. Does that make sense? So if there's a, um, we'll, we'll just get into this as we go. So, so um, Weber's gonna be particularly interested here in specifying Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, as a unique faith system. He's going to be making arguments that, that you know, in the long run, um, only in the Protestant Christian West did capitalism uh, formulate its sort of core genetic structure. Uh, so modern Western capitalism, the thing that ate the world from about 1650 forward, you know, was sort of born, um, you know, the, the unique configuration of genes was put together in Northern Europe somewhere around, say, 1650, and then it explodes from there uh, across the globe. And so he's going to be arguing that that particular ethic is clearly a middle strata ethic, and it is going to be a prophetically um, announced religion of redemption, a rational religion of redemption. So this is going to be one of the characteristics he's going to be looking for. The prophetically announced, there's going to be a prophet who's going to be announcing, announcing that, uh, that there is a savior or redeemer on its way, on his or her way, uh, um, and that this is a, going to be a, then a religion of redemption. It's going to be a religion of redemption, and it is going to be rational, and that's what he's going to be looking at here. Okay, in general, Weber argues that elites have no need for redemption. They've already got all the goods and goodies, right? And they already possess all of the power in society. So in general, the elites at the top of society aren't looking for redemption. They're not looking for a savior. They're looking for a legitimation for their already existing power and privilege. And so they tend not to be um, fostering or encouraging, or the primary bearers of a religion of redemption, of a savior coming to overturn the world and to, you know, uh, put the last first in the first last, right? The rich don't want that, right? So elites don't want redemption, and so they can tend not to be that carrier. Then he's going to be arguing that the lower strata, peasants and plebeians, look, these are people who need saving, right? Their life kind of sucks. So um, they also tend not to be the carriers or the bearers of these prophetically announced religions of, you know, rational religions of redemption, because the lower strata, peasants and so on, are always embedded in irrational magic. That the religion of the lower strata tends to be magical. So what does that mean? It means that there are there is either in you know sorcery or in, in just sort of pure magic formula that one is attempting to directly achieve the uh, material needs of life, um, health, wealth, um, subsistence, you know, keeping the cow from dying, uh, keeping colic away from the baby and so on, helping grandma get over her COVID. It, it, you're going to be praying and interceding and using religious formula, or magical formula, maybe, you know, using a variety of sort of associational imitative magic to achieve the ends uh, in view. So the lower strata tends to be magical, irrational. Uh, again, uh, um, not really oriented towards a rational reconstruction of life in alignment with the Redeemer's call, but is instead going to be attempting to survive life uh, to endure life, uh, the cycle of living, uh, by the means of, of, of by, 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 excuse me, by magical, simply by magical means, okay? So Weber's going to be really interested in these middle strata who carry forward these prophetically announced religions, okay? All right, so, um, so again, there are six world religions, according to Weber. There's only five plus Judaism, so we'll just call it six for simplicity's sake, um, and again, that's the religious dimension of economic ethics that he's looking at here. So what are economic ethics? Ethics really refer to the proper means to, uh, to, um, to approach or to pursue uh, proper ends, right? So it has to do with the means ends continuum, ethics does, right? So what are the proper means to uh, to 
pursue the ends of life, right? And so ethics really refers to that that sort of, con it's really about conduct, you know, control of conduct and, and um, you know, it's kind of an awake, aware um, fit of conduct to rational rules of life. Okay, that's what ethics refer to. Okay, so the carrier strata of the, um, of, of the, Economic ethics of the word religions are decisive. And so here's his list of what they are. So it begins on about page 268. Okay. So the five world religions and Judaism are Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, and then Judaism, right? Okay. So each of these world religions is going to have a different flavor. Uh, he writes a book about Confucianism and Buddhism together. He writes one on Hinduism. He writes one on on, uh, excuse me, on Christianity, really, which is what the, uh, um, um, much of the writings in economy and society are on Christianity. He doesn't write a complete work on, on Islam, but there are many references to Islam throughout his other work. And then, and then he writes, again, the great book, Ancient Judaism, on, on Judaism. Okay, so he really knows, you know, Weber really is a remarkable scholar. I'm, I'm always amazed at how much he knows. So, um, yeah, anyway, so Confucianism uh, is a religion uh, that the economic ethics of Confucianism are fixed by uh, the prebend, pre, uh, the, the, the prebend, prebenderies, I don't know how to pronounce that, prebenderies, the, the, the uh, possessors of prebend. So what's a prebend? A prebend is essentially a position within a bureaucratic hierarchy, uh, and you're not really paid for the work that you do, you are instead paid a kind of status um, uh, salary or a status uh, uh, a payment uh, for you to perform the duties of that position, right? So a prebend isn't really a wage. A prebend is a kind of support for uh, occupying a position that completes a status work. So something like a salary gets close to that as long as you think of a salary as something that pays you to do a task in total, like be responsible for a task rather than working hour for hour. I think a prebend comes closer to like what you would pay a um, 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 maybe a, a member of a board of directors of a corporation. You're not really paying them for the hours that they work, but you're giving them something in the form of, of money. Often, you know, uh, prebends are often uh, in kind. So you're getting housing and money, excuse me, housing, food, that kind of thing. Um, uh, you, you know, but, but anyway, it, it isn't a wage that you're paying for work. Okay, so so they're prebend possessing literati. So what's a literati? Well, it's people who, again, are skilled in, in, in the world of letters, right? So people who are capable of reading and writing. And in, um, you know, in ancient China, this is a very rare skill. Weber writes about, uh, you know, the, the pictographic language of, uh, uh, of alphabet of China how complex it is, there's a couple of thousand characters, and how difficult it was uh, to come into possession of the skill needed to be a reader and writer of this, you know, incredible pictographic language. And it was a skill that wasn't broadly possessed, and that if you were going to be an emperor ruling a large empire, you're going to need a bureaucracy, and if you need a bureaucracy, you need people who can read and write and keep records and so on. And so you need a literati. So Confucianism is dominated by the prebend possessing office holders in the um, in in the um, um, you know really the Ming Dynasty forward the 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 the, the, the holders of of office in these um, 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 in the state bureaucracy, right? So they're literate literati, um, and they possess a kind of ethic of secular rationalism. So they're rational, again, literate and so on, but they're really not specifically religious. So they're a cultured, literate strata, right? R secular rather than religious. Uh, and they have huge prestige relative all of the lower strata, right? And so, and there's, so there's like a mat, um, yeah, there's a massive prestige vacuum separating uh, the literati from the masses. So Confucianism then uh, is this, uh, again, it's an almost unreligious, he calls it, it's like at the borderland between religion and irreligion, but he claims that, that, that the economic ethic of Confucianism is stamped with this quality, the qualities of this particular group. Okay with a whole bunch of consequences, and one of the things he argues is that in 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 
in China because the um, ambitions of the lower strata were generally aimed not at becoming an aristocrat, which you couldn't do, or become a warrior, which is kind of difficult to do. Um, it was aimed at coming into possession of of a degree, have a qualification uh, to become an office holder in, 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 the, in the status hierarchy. So this meant that for millennia, uh, the ambitions of the lower strata in China uh, was aimed not at becoming a wealthy capitalist or becoming a, a warrior hero, but the ambition was generally aimed at becoming uh, a literate office holder, right? A kind of bureaucrat in the in the um, in the political state, and so Weber argues that this essentially then uh, forecloses the door to profit making. If you're ambitious, you become a literate uh, uh, prebend holder. You don't become a capitalist, right? So anyways, Confucianism is stamped by the economic ethic of this group of sort of state bureaucrats, literate, cultured, but not religious, really. Um, and, and, and again, with all kinds of consequences, okay? Hinduism is uh, stamped by the character of the hereditary, by the way, the, the literati in Confucianism were not uh, uh, hereditary. So uh, you could fall out and you could gain access to uh, the literati. Um, there, were, there were some advantages if you were already uh, uh, a member of the literati. Um, if your family was already in, you had some advantages, but you could still work your way in and out. Hinduism is fully hereditary. So it's a caste, a hereditary caste of cultural literati again. People are able to read and write uh, and therefore have all kinds of ritualistic power as a result of that. So they're ritualistic and spiritual advisors, the Brahmins, right? And um, yeah, and then that ethic then uh, that that is really associated with the Brahmins then over time infiltrates lower caste. So you, it develops a kind of unified quality, even though that the that the Dharma, the rules of conduct for each of the castes is distinct. The concept of karma and Dharma and, you know, a migration of souls and rebirth and all those other things that are part of Hinduism um, work their way down. So you kind of wind up with a unified religion. But the economic ethic itself is is stamped by the Brahmins, who essentially. Um, so again, this is not an economic ethic of work to get ahead. It's an economic of extreme traditionalism, a kind of extreme ossification, uh, and so on. So it, it again, it it it, it boot, Hinduism forecloses the pathway to modern Western capitalism, and and again, okay. So Buddhism. Um, Again, he claims that it's really it's a, it's an it's stamped by the economic ethics of contemplative monks, right? So if you think of the of the archetypal Buddhist, it's the person who's living in a monastery. So they're mendicants, so they're not working. They actually live upon alms giving, upon you know, especially you know, alms giving on the part of the working people. So they're non-working people who get alms from the workers, but they're honorific. So they're not really beggars. There's a kind of uh, high status, um, high uh, prestige uh, systems of, 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 um, of being a, um, an alms receiving monk. Um, it's elite, right? So, so it's really strange. It, 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 it's, it's an elite strata. It's an elite strata of, of non-working people who receive you know, charitable giving almost, right, from, from the masses. So it's an odd thing. Uh, where Buddhism thrives, you have masses who cannot become virtuoso Buddhists because they're working all the time and can't engage in the meditative practices that the uh, that the contemplative monks engage in, right? So they're sort of barred from heaven, sort of. I mean, it's not really heaven, but, you know, barred from, from enlightenment because they have to work. And they give their money over to the contemplative monks, right? So people who can't work to find enlightenment, give money to support those who do. So it's a kind of a strange thing. But as he keeps saying, you know, Buddhism as such is really, it's a religion of virtuosos, um, of experts, people who don't work and who really spend all of their time in, in idle, um, uh, economic idleness engaged in the, you know, I guess the work of, of, you know, meditation and spiritual exercises and so on to find enlightenment. 
Okay, so that kind of non-work ethic, right? Uh, they're an elite strata that exercises all kinds of prestige over the masses, right? They're separated from them. Um, but that, that ethic of kind of non-work, of contemplation and so on, uh, um, again, kind of works its way down, as it were. So it, it winds up again, it forecloses the door uh, to modern Western capitalism. Just to jump at this, what Weber is going to say is really important about Western capitalism, especially after the Protestant Reformation, is that the most religious people in society become those who get off of their knees and get out of the monasteries and go out and earn money. In other words, Protestant Christianity, especially the Calvinist reform versions of Protestant Christianity, shut down the mystical meditative paths to salvation, leaving only you know, the path of work. So all of these other religious systems um, wind up, again, think of it kind of like a cultural program, a kind of software system, that if you install Confucianism, Hinduism, or Buddhism, in a population, you're not going to lead that population down the path to modern Western capitalism, okay? You're going to be directed in other directions. In, just to be in a nutshell, what Weber argues is, is that all of these religions take you in the, tra the direction of what he would call the traditional, um, traditional economic ethic, oop, economic ethic, and the traditional economic ethic is that simple, um, argument that you work to live, right? If you want to put that in the terms that I use in my book, um, you that the draining of value of the social jelly out of human beings in the process of production is always in the end. You drain value to pursue values, right? That the ultimate ends of life are values, totems, taboos, religious ritual, meaningful activity, and so on. And so, so uh, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, most versions of Christianity, um, and, and to a degree, uh, uh, Judaism, again, there are values that matter. There's something in life that matters beyond the pursuit of value, the draining out of social jelly, and the pursuit of profit. His argument is going to be that, um, that Protestant Christianity and modern Western capitalism essentially blows away values external to value. So that what you wind up with is money making as the only value. So instead of work to live, you wind up with a world where you live to work, right? Where all values are sacrificed in the pursuit of value, where all of life <laughs> winds up transmuted into work, okay? So again, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam, uh, there are values that transcend the economic realm and that that's what matters more than, uh, you know, money making. Okay. All right. So the carrier strata of Islam then um, is a warrior um, uh, brotherhood, right? It's a religion of a warrior brotherhood. Um, crusaders, really, uh, they're, they're, they're like the, the exact um, um, parallel to the... Um, um, you know, the sort of chivalrous knights of the Crusades in, in, in the West, the people who fought against them, um, except that they had they didn't have the sexual asceticism that tended to be uh, widespread among the warriors of the West. So they're like, um, uh, you know, warrior brotherhood that isn't sexually ascetic, um, but they have that same kind of discipline. So it's a disciplined uh, religion, but it's not a disciplined religion in the pursuit of maximum wealth. It's a disciplined religion in the pursuit of of, of I guess, maximum um, ascetic conduct in everyday life. There's also a mystical component to it as well. But it evolved, it's, um, it also developed Sufism as a plebeian technique of orgiasm, you know, that involves all kinds of, get of mystical practices and so on. But at core, at core, Islam is a brotherhood. So it's a universal religion of the brotherhood of human beings, right? That uh, all are children of Allah. And that uh, it, it, it's not it's not like Judaism, which is a religion of a particular tribal or um, almost racially defined group of people. Um, instead, it, it's a universal uh, uh, religion. And again, I'm talking about ancient Judaism here, not not modern Judaism. OK, so that's Islam. So it's stamped with that with the kind of warrior ethic. Right. OK, so then you go on to Judaism. 
So Judaism is a religion of, of a civic, which means a city-based pariah people. And he really, in, in, their, in their ancient Judaism, the book Ancient Judaism, he said that almost everything you need to know about the economic ethics of ancient Judaism um, and of the Jews in general is linked to the fact that they are a pariah people. So what does that mean? Um, it's a little bit like the caste system in India. He makes the direct comparison at the opening of ancient Judaism, where you know in, in the caste system in India, if you touch or come into close contact with a member of another caste, it can be polluting. It's ritually polluting. They're literally kind of taboo. And so you must maintain a, a ritual avoidance of all kinds. Um, you know, you really, you're kind of ritually separate. You create a ritual vacuum uh, separating uh, the caste from each other. And this extends even to the subcaste. Um, you know, in, 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 um, in the book on, um, on religions of India, Weber argues, you know, there, there's several hundred subcastes that were ritually separated from each other. Uh, with all kinds of rules that you couldn't eat together, um, you couldn't intermarry. Um, he argues that you know, like 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 in in India, if 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 a one a member of one caste marries a member of another caste, the offspring is lower even than in the American uh, planter South or in the in the uh, Jim Crow South, where a a child of of mixed race was always you know the one drop of blood put them in the lower uh, racial category that became black. Um, but in India, uh, he writes, um, uh, uh, an offspring of a mixed caste relationship winds up in a, a third caste even lower, right? So, so there was huge, huge sort of um, penalties of social disesteem, right? Of, of kind of social stigma attached to uh, inter-caste uh, Congress. So, so that tended not to happen. Okay, so so each of the castes are separated by by ritual uh, rules of segregation, ritual rules of avoidance, ritual rules of pollution, and he makes the same thing is true about Judaism. So Judaism, uh, uh, the Jewish people wind up separated. Um, he he thinks it's really important. It's really a kind of the creation of what he calls a voluntary ghetto um, that they that they self segregate. Uh, again, they, they tend to really focus upon endogamy within the group. You can only marry within the group, and so on. Um, and so, it's it. So they're 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 a people set apart, right? A people who worship uh, a different, um, not necessarily a different god, but certainly a di different faith system. Uh, the Sabbath was on a different day. Um, you know, the rules of conduct were different, and so on. So they were a people set apart, a pariah people. So they were stigmatized to a degree, always, uh, in the host uh, society around them, the Christian society around them. Um, but they also maintained a kind of uh, voluntary uh, segregation as well. So there were rules of ritual pollution and ritual avoidance uh, that separated uh, the Jewish people from the other from, from those around them. They studied all kinds of things, like the uh, creation of of a of a dual economic ethic. Right. Um, this probably is also true of other pariah peoples, like the uh, like the Rome people, the Gypsy people, right, who treat insiders with a, with a sense of family or brotherhood, and outsiders with a, a much more um, profit seeking. Um, sometimes even exploitative economic ethic, but you don't exploit inside, you only exploit outside, that kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, so um, so it's a religion of a pariah people that's associated primarily with cities. Now, this is that latter form of Judaism, not the original form, which was clearly, uh, you know, these mountain uh, people uh, with herds of, of goats and that kind of thing. But at any rate, it's a religion of rabbis. Uh, rabbis are teachers, uh, literate, right? And ritualistic again, so you get that same quality of Hinduism and um, and Confucianism, um, where it, again it, it's it's a religion that's whose economic ethic is stamped by the rab rabbinical um, uh, tradition, so the literate ritualistic. Um, but it, again, it again has a bourgeois petty petty bourgeois uh, rational. Yeah, uh, rationalization and intel intellectualization of conduct. So, um, so again, Weber really thinks that that Judaism is really decisive for launching um, us down a path of um, of of of, uh, 
of ethical conduct in business. I mean, ethics in, in many ways begins with Judaism um, as the first great monotheistic faith system that, um, that you know, that, that uh, relies upon guilt instead of shame as a mechanism for uh, controlling sin. All right, so Christianity then is a doctrine, he said initially at least, a doctrine of itinerant artisan um, um, journeyman. All right, so this is like up to like the Middle Ages. They tended to be urban, it's a civil religion, um, it is um, citizens of Western cities really uh, uh, tended to be, you know, that's the Christian homeland, right? So, um, so it, again, a kind of city based um, itinerant artisan faith system. Okay, and so and then it gets stamped with that as you go. Now, of course, we know that that you know Weber's writings just blow this apart. There's tons of different variants of Christianity, and it all depends upon where and when, just the direction that this goes. So none of this is really, as he argues, is really decisive. It's like you only know the beginning of the social psychology, the word religions. But I wanted to go into a lot of detail with this for a reason. Weber is a sociologist. I mean, he's not just a historian. He's not a legal scholar. He's not a religious scholar. He's really a sociologist. And to him, if you're going to understand a religion, you can't just view it as in terms of the faith system that's revealed by, uh, by a prophet, nor can you view it as a, just a set of ritual practices. It's going to be carried by someone. And religions that tend to be world dominant are going to have some successful strata that is carrying that religion uh, into the world, right? And so it's going to be stamped and marked with a religious, with, excuse me, with an economic ethic of a fairly successful group, right? And so, um, so in history, um, yeah, the socially, yeah, and then so like on page 279, he argues that in, if a, the socially decisive strata of a religion change, in other words, if the bearer strata become a different strata, right? If a different group uh, carries the religion forward, the economic ethic tends to change as well, okay? Then he talks about Nietzsche's resentment, which we won't get into here, okay? All right, page 271, he gets into some, one, some of his core arguments of, of, the, of this essay and really of his entire studies of religion, and that deals with the problem of suffering, right? The problem of suffering. Okay, so suffering. Um, and... Um, yeah, so um, again, he's getting to that through uh, Nietzsche, but where he's headed with this is, is um, yeah, religion easily provides the theodicy of good fortune. It explains why people are fortunate, right? It's very easy to get there. If you're someone who's good or someone who's blessed by God, you're fortunate. The difficult thing, of course, is to explain suffering. Why do bad things happen uh, to good people, that kind of thing, right? So it's the theodicy of suffering, the explanation for the theological explanation for suffering in the world, right? And so why does this happen? So, and he's going to have this argument is that theodicy begins in highly robust uh, needs of man, easily understood, but then again, you, we have to make a transition, he argues, to understand the revaluation of values that leads to the way that religion functions in the West from just being a kind of legitimation for the, um, for the um, high position of elites to instead have religion be about explaining and comprehending the suffering of the non-elite. In other words, the theodicy of suffering is going to be important for helping us comprehend how, um, you know, how, how um, again, religion simply isn't just a a legitimation for elites, but how it becomes a kind of cultural programming for an entire, uh, um, you know, population of people. Okay, um, so the theodicy of suffering. So what is the theodicy of suffering? Again, it's the explanation for the existence of, 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 again, of, of suffering in the world, of bad things happening uh, to good people. Okay, all right. So he's going to argue that, but what happens in these world religions is that there tends to be that the negative valuation of suffering um, gets flipped over and you get a religious glorification of it instead. So numerous forms of chastisement and abstinences from normal diet and sleep, as well as of, of sexual intercourse, you know, abstaining from sex, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, the charisma of um, 
Yeah. So 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 you wind up with these. Uh, yeah, the concept of magical asceticism or asceticism, the um, the self chosen voluntary suffering. That's what suffering is. It's self chosen suffering. Is what asceticism is. Self chosen foregoing of pleasure. The self chosen um, foregoing of comfort. Right. The self going self chosen foregoing of pleasures. Right. So it's self induced suffering. That's what that's what asceticism is. And so most religions then uh, wind up developing this idea that suffering um, can become, uh, you know, initially it's a way, it's, it's, it's a sin, it's something you should purge. If you're suffering, it's a sign that the gods have turned against you and so on. But there's also suffering then that's, that's purative, uh, excuse, purifying, that's redemptive, right? Redemptive suffering. That you can actually, you know, um, get the God back on your side by by sacrificing your pleasures and so on, and so you get a revaluation of suffering, right? That so so asceticism, self chosen voluntary suffering, becomes a mechanism to achieve holiness. So this is a this is really a major change, right? Instead of suffering being a sign of sin, suffering becomes a mechanism for achieving. Um, um, purification and, 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 and achieving the good. Okay. All right. All right. So then there's different, uh, uh, types of religion. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, at the lower strata, uh, Weber is going to argue that the lower strata magic is going to be the mechanism that's going to be used to eliminate sin and to eliminate suffering. If you're suffering, if you're sick, you're going to approve a Approach a religious leader who's going to function as a magician and who's going to use again imitative and associational magic to magically, you know, help you alleviate that suffering, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so so that goes on. So um, yeah, so yeah, so the distinction then on page two seventy two between religion, which is a cult uh, rooted in, in 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 a community, versus a uh, magic which again, there's two kinds. There's piacular rites, um, which is magic that's aimed again at purifying a community. So it's communal, right? A community comes together and engages in magic to purify itself and to restore the good graces of the God versus magic that's individualized where you go to a magician as a client asking for help. So, you know, much of the religion of the lower castes, lower classes, lower strata in throughout the world and throughout world history has been magic. You collectively um, pursue the relief of suffering by engaging in purifying pura piacular rites and through approaching the religious leader in a client-like way, you know, paying them as a service professional to perform magic upon you, right? So you take a baby to a priest to have a magic ritual performed to remove sin. Um, if someone is suffering and dying, you used to call in a priest to come and perform, you know, last rites or the anointing of the sick, um, that kind of thing. Um, if you um, build a new home, you can call a priest in to have your home blessed, um, you know, um, um, the blessings of the throat um, during the Feast of St. Blaise in the Catholic Church, like in February, right? Some of which involves, you know, just, um, you know, the, again, these magic acts that are meant to alleviate suffering. suffering. Um, yeah. All right. So the lower, lower straight in society is always, uh, yeah, is always religious, but, and yeah, okay, yeah, page 270 through three. The lower strata is always the strata that develops the myth of the Savior, okay? But it isn't necessarily the lowest strata. It's just a low strata. And again, I think what Weber argues is that if you get too far down in the social structure, you're so embedded in magic that you wind up um, just focusing in upon the magical suff uh, the magical relief of suffering and the magical accommodation to the immediate needs of life. It isn't the lowest rate. It's usually somewhere in the middle that you get this, uh, the myth of the Savior that matters, right? The rational reconstruction of society with an end to suffering um, 
yeah, only those who suffer need saving. So it's only if you're suffering that you are in the position where you need a redeemer, right? So the myth of the redeemer, the myth of redemption, and, the, and is also linked then to the God who suffers and dies uh, to redeem humans. So again, this is, you know, from Isaiah forward to, um, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament in Christianity um, and elsewhere, right? So the theodicy of suffering originates in the hope of a savior. That's his argument on page 273, right? So you develop these religions that explain suffering and, and redeem suffering uh, with the hope of a savior. So instead of viewing the people who suffer as the people who are damned forever, uh, the people who suffer become the people who are um, who are the Savior's people, right? That the Savior, the Redeemer, will come to alleviate this, uh, uh, you know, again, the traumas and, and, and uh, uh, you know, negative effects of life um, on those. So, so suffering is an, a signifier of membership in the cult of salvation, okay? All right, page 274. Prophets, um, yeah, see, see, yeah. Okay, so... Often, prophets view sin as a result of disbelief and disobedience. This is certainly true in the uh, Judaic and Christian, uh, you know, uh, Old Testament writings, right? So, um, so prophetically announced religions of redemptions, again, always refer to a lower, lower stratus. So like in, in, um, in Judaism, right, it's, it's the, it's the, it, Again, it's a promise made to those who are captive are going to be captives. Those who are slaved are going to be slaved. Those who are persecuted by uh, overlords and so on. It's a religion of redemption of a lower strata. But again, to Weber, it's not the lowest strata. The, re the lowest strata um, is magically oriented. So if you're going to have a rational reconstruction of society, uh, you know, uh, on the part of a redemption, uh, of, of, of a salvation of some kind, a reevaluation of values, that this is going to be um, uh, something that's going to happen above the bottom, right? So it's a middle strata. It's a lower strata, but middle. Okay. So uh, I just love on page 274, he says it, it, it's when you get these religions of redemption that you get suffering acquiring a plus sign. So instead of it being viewed as a negative, it acquires a positive connotation. So, um, so you know, in... in um, you know, suffering is good for the soul. Uh, the idea that those who suffer in this world reduce their suffering in the next world. Um, you know, that those who are touched in some way with an affliction are often those who have a kind of special access to spiritual grace because, um, you know, uh, especially those who endure suffering with cheerfulness, right, tends to be something that is, uh, um, that has been valorized in, in, in religions of salvation. At any rate, suffering acquires a plus sign. Okay, so asceticism then, self-imposed suffering. Um, deprivation, right, emerges as a purification, right? Penance and redemption, right? Payment of some kind. So, so it is in these redemption religions then that you get not just a kind of focus upon the, in, in the eventual... Uh, emergence of a redeemer, but you also get all kinds of rituals of, again, of deprivation, of foregoing sin, of foregoing uh, pleasures and comforts, of asceticism or asceticism, of self-chosen suffering, voluntary suffering as a mechanism to pay for sin, to reduce suffering now, and to achieve redemption. So you get not just the physical relief of sin, but you get the psychological premium of being restored to a virtuous life. Okay, so page 275, uh, yeah, ideology and the theodicy of suffering and inequality. So he argues that really, again, there are only three solutions to the incongruity between destiny and merit, right? So theodicy of suffering can really only work out in three ways. In other words, how do you explain bad things happening to good people? There's only been three systems that have worked out. The first is sort of the Hindu system of karma where and the transmigration of souls. So this is Hinduism. And in Hinduism, you argue, basically, that those who are suffering sinned in a previous life and that they're suffering now because they had either um, been higher born in a previous life and had sinned a lot or they had already been 
a lowborn person maybe who lived well, like they were a really well-behaving earthworm who came back as a suffering, uh, you know, um, untouchable, or they had been a high-ranking Brahmin who sinned a lot and fell down, right? So, uh, so karma is the is sort of this notion that you wind up um, getting your just desserts in the next life. So wherever you fit in this life, you're where you belong because of the sins that your soul committed in previous lives and that your goal in life is not to try to work your way up or try to strive to change the condition of your life, but rather your goal in life is to accept your dharma, your, your, um, your um, you know, the rules of right conduct of your position in life and if you live and die in accordance with those rules, you'll have good karma that can lead to an upward mobility in the next life. So it's the migration of soul. Your soul will migrate. So that's one way to explain suffering, right? People who suffer now sinned in a previous life and that if they continue to suffer now and endure it well, that this will lead to upward mobility in the next life. There's also the Zoroastrian dual dualism that there are forces of good and forces of evil, and that the, the good and evil is combating in the world. You see a little bit of this in, in you know, the book of Job in the Old Testament, right, where God and the devil are sort of, uh, and Satan are sort of, you know, struggling against each other, causing Job to suffer, right? They kill his cattle, they cause boils to emerge. You know, why, God, why, right? And, and um, so suffering is resulting from this, um, you know, like in Zoroastrianism, in the, you know, the Persian dualism, good, bad, good, evil, heaven, hell, devils, and gods. And um, and so evil is the result of the forces of evil, um, you know, suffering results from the forces of evil playing out in the world, right? And so that's just the way it is. That's the nature of it. It's the ontology of the world, right? Is that evil is present in it. Right, so you have that workout, and then you finally have the one, and, and so this is a huge proportion of world religions have this in it, right? So Christianity certainly does, um, to, uh, you know, Judaism certainly does, right? Um, and so um, the final way to work it out is predestination. So predestination is the notion of, you know, Deus obscunditus, right? That that uh, God has absconded, God has left the world, that there's God was a creator God, and once the world was created, the, the creator God left. The creator God knows who's saved and damned, and you're predis predestined to hell or heaven before you're born, which means that in this world, you're either predestined to suffer or predestined, um, you know, to comfort and virtue and high position. And so um, the reason that you're suffering is because you were predestined to do it, right? And you're likely a damned, a member of the damned, uh, you know, the group going to hell. And that if you're thriving and doing well, if you're manifesting health and wealth in life, then you're likely one of the saved. Okay, so then you have the logic of predestination. Okay, so he claims those are the three ways that this works out. You can see where he's going. Modern Western capitalism, he argues, depends upon um, this one. It's the last version. The notion of predestination becomes really important. We'll try to get to why that is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, elites ha always have special privileges um, in that that is just simply, on um, page 276, the nature of the beast. You know, they're not going to, again, be... Um, striving to prove that they deserve redemption, they're already redeemed, right? So page 276, satiated elites have no need for salvation, hence salvation religions and the rational life conduct are always a trait of the lower strata. So capitalism literally isn't going to emerge from the aristocratic elite. Capitalism is going to emerge from a lower strata, not all the way to the bottom, but a lower strata who's engaged in rational life conduct and uh, justified by a, a salvation religion. So to be ascetic and methodical and ethical is to be a, a person of a lower strata. Again, not the lowest strata. If you get all the way down to the bottom, you're not ascetic, you're magical. You're not methodical, you're magical. And you're not ethical, you're magical. So it's not the lowest strata. Again, it's that middle strata, right? The lower are magical, the upper are sort of content to live in their satiated gold toilets and so on. Um, and, and it's the middle strata that matter, 
Okay, so the masses, again, remain magical and avoid ethical theodicy. That's page 279. So that's the point we just made. Okay, uh, 277. Uh, yeah, so elites then are glorified and blessed um, and already graced. Masses are magical. So it's the middle strata that is decisive for generating these religions of salvation that lead to the methodical, rational reconstruction of conduct, okay? And lead to capitalism. So most religions have, have, um, have been worldly. Uh, and so that they've embraced the world. Certainly all magical religions are worldly. They focus upon health, long life, and prosperity. That's what he means by that. In other words, the ends of the religious uh, system are this worldly. You're looking at improving your lot in this world. Again, health, long life, keeping the red cow alive, and that kind of stuff. Prosperity and wealth. Um, Chinese religion, Vedic religion, Zoroastrianism among the Persians, uh, ancient Israelis, uh, Israeli religion, Islam, Almost all ancient faiths were essentially uh, worldly faiths, right? So what you're, the reason that there is religion is to organize social life. And like we talked about before, uh, you know, religion is essentially a kind of a misrecognition of society itself, such that society presents itself to itself as a god or a totem. And so the ends of the god or the totem are always going to be this worldly, aimed at this world. Now, what Weber is going to say is that the capitalism depends upon an otherworldly religion, a world, a religion that aims at change in another world, that devalues this world and reduces this world, the world that we actually live in, our bodies and so on, that these are not the ultimate ends of life. The fate of your soul is what matters, not the fate of your body. Um, what happens to your soul in the afterlife matters much more than what happens to you here, right? So it's an otherworldly uh, religion. So only religious virtuosos, historically, and most world religions, and most of them, it's only the virtuosos, the people who are these experts, who become special expert specialists, right, in religiosity. People are religiously musical, to use the language of, of, of Weber. Uh, become ascetic, become voluntary sufferers. They become monks, they become Sufis, they become dervishes. They strive for the sacred otherworldly ends, right? They become specialists in achieving enlightenment or specialists in achieving salvation, those kinds of things. Spiritual otherworldly goods rather than solid material goods on this world, right? So in almost all world religions, the masses focus on this world Health, wealth, keeping the cow alive, keeping colic off the baby, you know, keeping, um, you know, keeping the palsy away from grandma, and um, and it's only a few virtuosos who go into the convents, who become monks, and so on, who pursue otherworldly ends, right, spiritual ends. Page two seventy eight. Otherworldly ends often are proved in this world, right? Psychologically, uh, orgiastic, yeah, religion, yeah, that's just, yeah, the ecstasy of mystic union and psychological state. So, so it's really funny that these religions that that if a religion is going to make otherworldly ends widespread as a mass phenomena, it's going to become have a kind of material bearer or a material symptomology. Too big of words. What that means is, is that if you are going to have people become specialists on saving themselves in the next life, right, or trying to become spiritual or enlightened in the next life, if this is going to be a mass phenomena, there are going to be signs of that. You're going to be able to prove that materially in this world, right? Either through an orgiastic state of, of uh, again, a mystical union with, with the God or with the spirit world or something, or some other mode, right? So, so, but there's going to be a kind of way to symptomatically see whether someone has achieved enlightenment or achieved salvation or not, okay? So rationalized religions sublimate the orgy into sacraments. He thinks that's important. So you get rid of that kind of... Um, un so a sacrament is rational. So I was Catholic as a boy growing up. Um, 
So, you know, you go to confession on a routine basis, you go to mass on a routine basis, you go to religious rituals and festivals on a routine basis. It's a rational system. Sacraments are rationalized systems as opposed to orgies, which are sort of these, and, and we don't mean sex here. It can have sex, but, but it means more, you know, the kind of mystical, enthusiastic, you know, religions of the dance and so on. That's, that's unsystematic. So peasants and so on, aren't going to quite become fully sacramental. There's also going to be extra sacramental, um, mystical, uh, orgiastic belief on the part of peasants. But but a, a true rational religion gets rid of the orgy, gets rid of the extraneous, extra rational uh, uh, um, magic to, to reduce magic to a formula. And that's what a sacrament is. Okay, so the mystical union, the myth, the mythical path to salvation, the mystical path to salvation, um, is experienced in the here and now. All right, so so Weber is going to tell us now that there are basically two paths to salvation. All right, and path one, um, God, let's jump ahead here. Actually, he does this probably most cleanly in the religious rejections of the world chapter. Can we just jump to that? Yeah. Yeah. So on page 324 in the essay on religious rejections of the world and their directions, Weber clearly distinguishes between um, asceticism and mysticism. So there's two pathways to salvation or two routes that a religious virtuoso or the masses in a rational religion two routes, two roads that can lead you to salvation. My dad used to say it. There's only two ways to get to heaven, my way and every on all the wrong ways, right? Something like that, right? So, um, so he argues that one of the ways is the way of asceticism, and the other is the way of mysticism. So in asceticism, um, you become an instrument of God, a tool of God. So you don't view God's presence. Instead, you act actively uh, to... Um, and, and yeah, and so if God is supra mundane, supra means over or out, mundane means the world. So otherworldly or out of the world, if God is gone, if there was a creator God that was here but is gone, you can't feel the God. So the mystical path is closed. So instead of feeling the God, the God is something out there and the God has laws and you obey the laws, you act ethically by suffering, by foregoing pleasures and suffering, right? So supramundane gods, like the Judaic God of, of, of the book of Isaiah, um, or the God of the, of, of the Puritans, um, the Judaic God really, right? Is a supramundane God that can no longer be accessed here. You can't see God anymore. God went away at some point, right? And you can't call them forth. There's no more burning bushes and so on. And so instead of sacrificing to a God that's not around anymore, as God, Yahweh says it right in Isaiah, stop burning fat calves to me. I've had enough fat calves. It makes me sick. Stop sinning and, sa and, sac and sacrificing by God. Why don't you instead just follow the law? So that's asceticism. Asceticism is following a law, being active, orienting yourself to the world as an instrument or tool of the God, right? You don't feel the God but you act in accordance with the law or the rules of the God. And that's what happens when you have a super mundane God, a God that's gone. Okay, the other form is, uh, is the mystic path to salvation, where you, have, where you are uh, the vessel of the God. So let's just link this together. So on page two, 325, he summarizes it. So when you have a supra mundane God, so that's otherworldly God, a God that's not here in the world but gone, right? And that's opposed to an imminent God, a God of imminence. So an imminent God is here in the world as an active force. If God is here as an active force, is a mundane God, right? A totem, basically, right? That God can be experienced. And if you can experience the God, then you can have a mystical uh, connection with them. So to have a mystical union with God is to become a vessel, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled, to be a vessel for this 
divine substance or this animating force that comes into this new soul that comes into you and animates you, right? So, um, so the kind of prophet that is associated with a, an imminent God and mysticism, mystical experience, the mystical path of salvation, is what's called an exemplary prophet or a saint. An exemplary prophet is someone who shows you by example how you can become filled with the spirit of the divine, right? So Buddha or Gautama is, is the ultimate exemplary prophet. Um, this is a person who showed us the example, the path to enlightenment, right? Uh, and you follow that path. Or, you know, uh, St. John the Divine or somebody who shows us the path to salvation, right? If you behave as I do, you can achieve salvation like I do, okay? So the mystical path to salvation is to, not to rationally control your conduct, but instead to fill yourself up with the Holy Spirit, to be enthusiastically filled with the Spirit, right? An exemplary prophet show you how to do that, and that's an imminent mundane God that can fill you. The God of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the God of, 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 of the Puritans, um, really the Jewish God after Isaiah, is a super mundane God, gone otherworldly, out of the world, can't be uh, experienced. You're not going to be filled with God's Spirit. So the kind of prophet that comes doesn't give you an example of how to become mystically united with God. You're going to get an emissary prophet who emits, who has a mission, who tells you things, right? Who gives you a law, gives you a message, right? An emissary prophet delivers a message, right? And, and usually the message is stop sinning, stop sacrificing, stop praying, and start obeying, right? Follow the law. And so so get to it. So that means be ascetic, engage in voluntary suffering by following the law, following the path, right? The path to salvation. But it's not a path to enlightenment in the world. It's a path to uh, salvation without uh, feeling it, right? Okay, so back to where we were. So uh, Weber argues on 278 that any salvation religion that emphasizes the mystical union, that the God is here, mundane, you can feel him, it's imminent in the world, you have an exemplary prophet showing you how to become a vessel, you're going to experience salvation in the here and now, right? So in salvation religions, right, such sacramental states are really important, right? And he says there's two of them. It's the experience on 279 of rebirth and the experience of redemption. The rebirth of the experience of us having a new soul. If you've ever had anyone who's gone through a conversion experience and they're really enthusiastic about it, they'll tell you all about the rebirth that they've had, the new soul that they've acquired through either mysticism or asceticism, but by God, they've got it. They can tell you about it. The rites of passage, the rites of ensoulment that they went through. Uh, they can tell you what kind of soul that they have. Um, is it one of your rational values, like the warriors and the peasants? Is it a rational value one, like the intellectual and business people? By the way, uh, Weber thinks that's the decisive one. But anyway, you're going to get a new soul. So that's the rebirth. And then redemption, uh, he describes it on page 280. It's that relief from suffering. That's what redemption is. You're redeemed. You're no longer suffering, and you realize that you're in a new world, right? So uh, you get you get a switch thrown, kind of. And he talks on page 230. 280, the cultural switch man of history, that when you this occurs, you really have like a like a new pathway. And when it's done on a cultural level, it leads to like a new, a new, um, a new, uh, a new way. Okay. So uh so the one that really matters to Weber, uh, the one that drives Western capitalism forward is the is this one, is the uh rebirth through um an ensoulment through asceticism that's rational. So you in this he claims that this is the kind of salvation associated with intellectual and business people, right? And intellectuals, right? So increased rationalization of religion as a result. Okay, so then he talks a lot about rationalization from there. He goes on about it. So um so as intellectuals rationalize purely religion, uh the irrational then is left over and winds up back in a kind of um so mysticism is rarely ever completely removed from the world. It winds up living at the limit of rationalization. He's going to make the argument that it really it's only in Puritanism where you completely blow away mysticism. I think he's wrong in that, by the way, but we'll just leave it. Um, 
So Weber on page 21 writes about music, that the richness of tonality is due to the irrationality that remains in music, that no matter how you try to rationally systematize music, there's always a little bit of irrationality that remains, and that irrationality is what provides some of the, again, some of the most beautiful, um, you know, tonality of, of music. You know that if you're playing a chord, it is the irrational notes that are most sort of um, um, emotive right? And move us in some way. All right. So there's always a rash rational elements um, that's left over in the, in the rationalization of the real. Okay. All right. Um, so mysticism erupts then to cover over or to paste over the limits and the gaps in, um, in the inconsistencies of any rational order, right? So like my, uh, like my priest told me when I was a boy, it's a mystery, right? Whenever you really couldn't explain something, you wind up with a mystery, uh, you wind up with charisma, you wind up with uh, a miracle, that kind of thing, right? So, so even the most um, rationalized religion that is about with a super mundane God and in an emissary prophet that's giving you a message that you must stop sinning and follow the law, there usually remains some remnant of sacrifice and of magic that remains, right? Okay, so um, so page 282, mystical experience then become very, very intensified as, um, as asceticism's leftover, that as a religion, again, almost completely eliminates mysticism, the little bit of mysticism that remains becomes absolutely decisive, okay? All right, so should we go on ahead with this? Um, yeah, the code of honor and so on. So I think page 283 to 4 is the crucial passages that the carrier strata of the bourgeois civic business person, right? The, the capitalist business person, the civic strata, they're practically rational in conduct. Uh, they live an ethical life that's uh, communicated through prophets. Again, not an exemplary prophet. They use an emissary prophet. And that the Western way tends towards active asceticism through emissaries, right? Rather than contemplative mysticism or magic orgies or, uh, or, or you know, sacrifice, that kind of thing. So the Protestant Christian version of Jesus, especially the Calvinist version of Jesus, Jesus did not live an exemplary life in the sense of teaching us how to become filled with the Holy Spirit and to experience that kind of, you know, like, like Martin Luther's moment of redemption where sin seems to fall away and you seem to be full of grace as a, as a psychological experience. No. Weber argues that modern Western capitalism is rooted in ultimately the kind of Calvinist reformed Protestant Christian emphasis upon ethics, upon Active asceticism, you actively voluntarily suffer by foregoing pleasures and foregoing sin. So Jesus was essentially an emissary prophet, not an exemplary prophet, showing us the way, and his death on the cross was essentially a, a, con a contractual arrangement where he paid a price. It was like a payment that was made and that we are now to live this active ascetive life. We're not contemplative, contemplatives, we shouldn't be on our knees, we shouldn't be praying, we shouldn't be going to monasteries, we shouldn't be sacrificing, we shouldn't be having orgies or looking at magic. We shouldn't have said, shut up, um, follow the law, don't sin, and so on. So this leads to what he calls this worldly asceticism. So otherworldly asceticism, where you engage in asceticism in order to arrive at some moment of mystical union, but this worldly asceticism is where you engage in payment of, of, again, of suffering, voluntary suffering, to achieve purely this worldly ends, right? Which is really weird, to achieve effects on this world. Now, ultimately, it's for other worldly ends, but it manifests itself in this worldly symptoms, okay? So it's rational, ethical ends in this life. So here it is. You see that that um, the carrier strata of Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity in Northern Europe, um, it was civic, city-based, capitalist business people who, again, practically rational in their conduct, ethical in their conduct. I know this is hard to believe when we're looking at capitalism today, but the capitalism that Weber was writing about was an ethical capitalism. Um, and so the, the religion of... A, 
otherworldly God, a religion that avoids all orgiastic experience of mystical union and so on, and all sacrifice and all magic, and instead sort of locks people in to, um, to ascetic, voluntary suffering in pursuit of the law. Um, that's what leads us to capitalism, right? So, um, yeah, so you get rid of the otherworldly um, uh, asceticism of, of sacrifice. So page 286 then, um, the God then that we're interested in here in modern Western capitalism is the supramundane God, the God that created the world and left. So that means otherworldly or out of this world versus an imminent God, which is the God that's everywhere in American popular Christianity, the God that can be experienced, the God that you can pray to, the God that can fill you with grace, right? The God that can... Uh, you know, relieve your sins and, and, and leave you in a state of grace like in, in, in Catholicism or a kind of psychological state of grace like in uh, the charismatic uh, evangelical um, uh, sex. Um, so page 27, religious rationalization of the world uh, always is carried by, again, the middle strata, not the lower. They remain irrational and magic, not the upper. They remain self-satisfied in their own glory, kind of narcissistic. It's really that middle strata that carries this active asceticism. So ultimate values decision then um, is towards ethical rationalization, not towards nirvana or mysticism. And then instead of a virtuoso religion, you wind up with a mass religion. Um, however, as Weber talks about, since it's always a middle strata that is really the carrier here, usually mass religion, even in a rational salvation faith system, may always maintains uh, something on the order of magical components. Um, he talks about religious sex. He quotes um, SCCTS. He quotes um, Ernst Trausch, who argues that sex, you know, especially Protestant sex, only accept the religiously qualified into them. The virtuosos, you have to prove that you're qualified, prove that you're good. And therefore, churches, like the Catholic church I was born into, take the masses, the saved and the damned, go to church. But in a sect where you convert into it, where you have to be qualified, where there's a huge sort of uh, inquiry, examination of consciousness, submission to discipline, all kinds of things, not everyone gets in, right? So only the saved get in, the damned are thrown out, right? All right. So the sex become the carriers of bourgeois um, um, active asceticism. The sex, the Protestant sex, take us into modern Western capitalism, not the churches. All right. So, um, yeah. And then an oriental and aristocratic system, uh, rap rationalization of a privileged strata leaves the masses alone in magic. And it's really only in the West, Western capitalism, that there was a tendency to rationalize all life, everyone, not just the saved, but the damned, not just a few people at the top, but a um, broad middle strata who then begin to systematically try to rationalize everyone else, right? So you wind up with a, uh, an ethic of workaday living that the virtuous pursue. So this is the famous Protestant work ethic, right, um, that Weber writes about. It was originally associated only with the sex in the middle, the Protestants. Again, you, the Protestant sex only accepted those who were qualified. <laughs> if you were a, a known sinner, you weren't in. Now you could be controlled and dominated by one of the saved, but, but you weren't in. So to Weber, uh, again, these folks, once they begin having businesses, these virtuosos, they develop an ethic of workaday living that they then impose down on other folks. So page 290. When these virtuosos uh, of mysticism, or ma yeah, so if the religious virtuosos pursue mysticism or magic that blocks the rationalization of thought and of conduct, um, you wind up with contemplative flights from the world, and only the elite can do that, like in Buddhism. Only the elite can actually pursue that rational, systematic reconstruction of life in the pursuit of enlightenment. Only the monks can do it. If you work for a living, you can't do it, right? So it's only in the West, right, where the virtuosos encourage active asceticism in the world, at work, and that forces everyone, even those who are damned and sinners, to begin to rationally construct conduct as well, right? 
So this is especially true in ascetic Protestantism in Western uh, morality, right? So on page 291, then you get the, um, the uh, major argument. This is the argument of the essay, and it also is the argument of most of Weber's writings on, on uh, here, on, on um, yeah. When religious virtuosos have combined into an active asceticist sect, two aims are completely attained. Okay, so this is what we're looking for. He claims this is a rare thing to occur in, in history. In fact, it probably happened once, and that was in the Calvinist uh, religions of, of Northern Europe in, you know, in the era immediately after the Reformation. That's when you get the active asceticist sect emerges. You get two aims are attained. You get the disenchantment of the world. What does that mean? You get all spirits, all demons, that whole world of animism disappears. The world is completely devoid of values, okay? So this is my book I'm working on right now. Got to get this thing done. But what, what values are wiped out? There's no more devils, demons, um, spiritual forces, trophies, totems, gods. It's all gone, right? It's all gone. And remember that the god of the active ascetus of sex was also gone. That's what a super mundane god means. A super mundane god, the god of the Calvinist Protestants, is gone. And when the god left, the values went too. Okay, so the disenchantment of the world and the blockage of the path to salvation by flight from the world. So you can't just run away to a monastery and become a religious contemplative. If you're serious about religion, you have no choice but to get into the world, and the world is devoid of values. You've got to get in the world and fight your way through, right? You can't just run off to a monastery. The path to salvation is turned away from the contemplative flight from the world, away from the monasteries, away from being a Buddhist monk, and towards an active ascetic work in the world. If one disregards the small rational sects that follow over the world, this has been attained only in the great church and sect organizations of Western and asceticist Protestantism. That's it. And so there's his argument. This is what launches us down. Yeah. So the religious virtuoso then is placed in the world as an instrument of a god and cut off from all magical means of salvation. That's it. Only here does it ever happen. You get all magic eliminated. Uh, at the same time, it's imperative for the virtuoso that he prove himself before God, right? And that's it. Um, only in Western uh, capitalism. So you get the devaluation of worldly sin and, and so on. So it's, it's a remarkable piece. This is one of my favorite uh, pieces. It launched me uh, on the book that I'm working on right now in economic theology. So, um, so that's it. So this very short essay... Uh, was originally written as an introduction to Weber's collected writings on the economic ethics of the world religions. Um, and it really reveals, um, uh, again, a kind of, you know, 15-year project of reading and scholarship that's summarized in, you know, less than 50 pages. All right. I hope you found that useful.